Tommy here from Orange Systems, and we're going to talk about building an open source lab using XCPNG, including how the virtual networking works inside of it. If you want to learn more about me and my company, head over to lawrencesystems.com. There's a hire us button right up at the top. If you want to support this channel in other ways, there is affiliate links well on the side of our website and down below this video to get you deals and discounts on products and services we talk about on this channel. That does include shirts because this question seems to come up a lot in the comments. And where do you get the shirts? There's an affiliate link for the shirts over on Teespring. Uh, if you like any of the shirts that we have or ones you've seen us wear that are available on our store, you can order them here. Um, shipping is pretty much all over the place. Teespring takes care of all that for us. All right. XCPNG is the fully open source hypervisor. I've talked about a lot on this channel, but I wanted to give you a getting started video. Now I have videos that I'll reference that go in depth on other topics, but this is the basics of getting you started. This is a fully open source product and it does offer paid support if you want it. We're gonna talk about it from the concept of building your own lab, which means we're gonna use the open source unsupported versions of this. You can get support from their forums and have discussions. Um, they do offer, you know, a good community. Actually, they have quite a big community, as they point out here. 23,000 forum posts and over 90,000 downloads of this and 3,400 forum contributors. So they have a very active, very healthy online community, which is great if you're looking for basic help. So I think this is a great product with a great community to build your system on. But it also does work in the production environments of large scale enterprises. And that's also why I want to start with what is Zen Orchestra? What is the architecture of this and what is Zen Project? So Zen Project is the actual hypervisor itself, but not the whole thing. Zen Orchestra is an orchestrating tool that runs on top of it. So you have XOA, the Zen server, which is over here, XCPNG, but XOA actually supports both the Citrix one and the open source one from here. Citrix has their own version. This is separate from Citrix, but Citrix does pull, just so you know, the same Zen server at the core and Zen server itself at the core is, if you're wondering just how popular of a project it is, this is still the primary hypervisor within Amazon. And I know Amazon uses more than one, but this, the Zen core, not XCPNG, but the Zen core is a big part of the hypervisor system that's used in enterprise things like Amazon and XCPNG is used very frequently, like I said, in large production environments. All right. We'll start at the hardware level and Picking out a server means, well, some, you know, guesswork sometimes for things. They do have a hypervisor hardware compatibility list. Generally speaking, it does work on a very broad range of hardware, but will it work? Is it hardware compatibility certified? That matters a lot in the enterprise market. And I just chose a Dell server, but I mean, they have a lot more than just Dell in here. And they bring up Dell because uh, one of the affiliates down below is Tech Supply Direct and they do offer discounts. And for example, I just did a video with the uh, Dell R630. It's 100% compatible with Zen server. It's on the list here. You can spec one out and I have a separate review I did of this. It's a good server to run this on. But obviously, if you're building a lab, it kind of comes down to whatever you have. So even if you don't have a system that matches this hardware compatibility list, it doesn't mean it won't run. Specifically, the lab server we're building here is on an AMD FX processor with 24 gigs of RAM and an SSD and uh, some random motherboard that we had. I purposely built it, one, out of spare parts I had, two, to show that, yes, it'll work with things that aren't even on the list. Um, but anytime you go off list with it, there could be potentially compatibility issues. And there's workarounds for some of those compatibility issues that you can discuss in the forums. Now, architecture wise, this is where sometimes it's a little bit confusing and this is an important part of the video uh, that I wanted to start with. When you're loading XCPNG, which we will go through the loading process of, XOA, Zen Orchestra, the preferred way to control and manage the servers is a VM that runs within it. This is different than some other projects and I'll bring up Proxmox. I don't really use Proxmox, but of course I'm familiar with it. They integrate it all into one system. And that's just a different architectural design to load it and have the management platform be within it. Zen has been done differently for a long time. And one of the reasons that is scalability. So you can have a single system running XOA, one VM, wherever that VM lives. Matter of fact, it doesn't have to live inside of a uh, Zen server, but traditionally you do. It's one of the servers you'd have running on there. You can, But I could be running it directly even on my computer right here if I wanted to. It's a web-based application and there's instructions and we'll get to those on how to build it, or you can just download it from them. But from one server, you can run many, many Zen servers. 
So from a concept of that, you can even, and they have options to work remotely, I can have a Zen server running, it's an orchestra server running here at my office and VPN into other clients that are remotely and manage all of their VMs with it. So Zen Orchestra offers a large amount of flexibility and scalability by doing it this way. So you can have all these machines deployed and even if they're completely separate pools, for example. So you pool resources together. So you take a series of physical Zen servers and you create a resource pool. So you can do things like high availability or just easily you know, move VMs around between those resource pools. Zen Orchestra can connect different pools together and move machines between them. And this is really easy for us because we have our main production pool and we have our lab pool. I'm going to be focusing on the lab pool, but I can use one instance of Zen Orchestra to manage both pools very easily and move VMs between them. Even though the servers don't have to know each other, Zen Orchestra will handle the introduction, so to speak, of the servers so they can speak to each other and pass VMs around between them, provided they're all on the same version of XCPNG. I do bring that up because there's sometimes just compatibility. So if you have one on a newer one and one on the older one, Older will go to newer, but newer doesn't always go to older. There can sometimes be compatibilities. It's always best when they're on the same, but Zen Orchestra can handle talking to pools that are at different versions. So even if some are at older versions, you haven't got it on upgrading, and some are at newer, Zen Orchestra will communicate with them. All right. So first thing to do is download it, pretty easy. Uh, grab the ISO and install it. Now I've already physically loaded it on the hardware, but what I'm gonna do now is walk you through what it looks like to go through the load and what the options are to choose. Now when it boots, you've got two options, standard boot or advanced. We're gonna look at the advanced options. And what these are is if you have certain edge cases, like installer upgrade, uh, alternate kernel options, serial console, et cetera. There's a couple different things if you have an edge case. Um, and like I said, if you have certain hardware compatibilities, you may want to try one of the other kernels or the install 2G. That's for some of the um, Ryzen systems that there's some working out compatibility issues with and same with some of the Epic. So let's go back over here and we're just going to go through the standard install, go through the boot installer here. So press enter and I'll uh, fast forward through this while it boots. Once it boots, you're presented with, you know, kind of a basic style older as I have uh, been around for a while, Linux style installer, um, press enter next, you know, pretty basic here, check for existing products. I've loaded this demo before, so it's going to find an existing one. Now, one of the nice things about how this works, we're going to perform a clean install, but it also sees backups on here. When you do the upgrades, you actually will upgrade them when there's full releases the same way. You put the drive in and you install over the top and it performs an upgrade, but it keeps a backup. This is a great way to do it because whenever you're doing this, you can always go back and just pop the drive in. And if it doesn't go well, restore from that backup. We're going to go ahead and delete and put a clean installation in here. We're not worried about the backup. Now, hardware wise, this has got an 80 gig hard drive in it. This is the demo one. The uh, machine, the hardware we built it on has 120 gig SSD in it. I put two in this particular uh, system to show you that there's an option comes up for software RAID. So I do have the ability, if I wanted to, uh, hit software RAID and I can RAID two systems together, or two, I'm sorry, two drives together to make a RAID if I wanted to. Uh, we're not going to for this demo. I just want to show you that was an option there. And if you're using enterprise hardware, you can also present a single large drive, like with the Dell RAID utility would be an example, like I did in my Dell R630 review to XCPNG and just have it install there. Now XCPNG slices a part for the operating system and will take the remaining hard drive, whatever size that is, and leave it for storage for the VMs as a local storage. There are ways later to add more storage to it, or you could start putting all the drives together themselves. There's a couple different options you can think about for doing this, but you at least want to install it on one drive uh, itself, maybe one smaller SSD that's on the system, but it'll still take the leftover it doesn't use and allow you to use it as local storage. Now, this is the part where it's going to ask about the local storage, essentially. We could merge these together and put them both in here in storage. For now, for simplicity, we're going to do it as EXT because this is going to match the physical hardware when we get there. I prefer the EXT file base, maybe slower, but thin provisioning. I, I can't really say, and you can go look in the forums, there's barely any noticeable speed difference between LVM or EXT, especially because now the newer versions are using EXT4. The previous versions were using EXT3. Uh, so I don't think there's much of a difference anymore. And, but uh, my preference, because I'm more familiar with managing the EXT system, I'm less familiar with LVM, is EXT, plus it supports the thin provisioning. Press OK. Local media. Scanning. Live dangerous and skip verification of the media. 
give it a password, which doesn't really matter because we're going to change it. And this is just the demo for install. Static is probably your preferred. So 192 and 683 dot 10, oh, two, oh, 210. Whatever works for you, match it to your network settings when it's free. You can work this as DHCP if you want, um, but it's probably easier to find the system if you statically assign it to an unused address. Give it a name. DNS servers, whatever your preference is. Choose a time zone. We'll skip this for now, but you can put your, oh, I think, it, is it, uh, I'll put, I don't think that's the right one. Put a proper time server in there and hit install. This will take a little while. It's going to go through the installation, eject, and reboot. Uh, depending on the speed of your hardware, this may take about 5 to 15 minutes to install. Like I said, wild variation comes with how fast your hardware is. Really fast hardware, install faster. So now we're going to get out of this and show you what the next step is to, for getting this set up. All right, once the system's loaded, you go to HTTP 192.168.3.210, the IP address we assigned to the system. It says, welcome to XCPNG 8.10. Now, as of 8.1, like I said, there's no management interface here to actually uh, manage the system, but it gives you some options for a quick deploy or download. Before we do either one of those, I SSH into the system. So root at 192.168.3.210, uh, and we're going to do a yum upgrade. Okay, no updates done. This is actually because I've already done the upgrades on here. The first time you log in, there's probably going to be some updates depending on when you downloaded, what version you downloaded, and if there's been any updates. But the good news is from the command line, and it's better to do it before you load anything, just yum upgrade. It runs through the upgrade process, and then you just can do a shutdown dash R now, and it'll restart. So we're also going to pull this up. Now, if you were to plug in directly to the machine that this is running on right now, and this is what you would see the status display, you know, network management, et cetera, and this interface. This is what's actually on the screen right now as far as like if it booted up. But you don't really have to do anything with this, and pretty much the machine right now is sitting in our lab and is headless. It doesn't have a monitor plugged in at all. So let's go back over here and talk about quick deploy. So the two options for management are Zen Orchestra. The older one, and I've talked about this in my older videos, but I don't really use it at all anymore, is XCPNG Center. As a matter of fact, with the 8.1, please note, make sure you have the latest version because they just fixed a bunch of bug updates where it was trying to pull some of the wrong updates for it. Um, this is the lesser maintained and lesser featured system, and it doesn't have as many features as Zen Orchestra does. So Zen Orchestra has everything. Like it's a pretty extensive, uh, everything from backups and continuous replication and all the different bells and whistles, including a lot of advanced networking options. But of course they have a paid version versus a free version. And let's talk about that. When you run the deploy, it's gonna run right here and we'll put in the password, connect and put an IP address, and this is really slick. It goes through here, it, it can see all the different networks that, that are on this, and we'll get to those in a second. Uh, it's gonna see normally just the main network. You put in the IP address you wanna assign to this, and it's gonna load and launch the free version of Zen Orchestra. And they have a comparison for what's in your free package and things like that, limited support, but it does work. You don't get all the cool auto patching, rolling snapshot, full backup features, and all the cool reporting features on the starter. You do get 15, days of premium included with it, which is pretty cool. So you can actually use it to play around and see what all the full features are. But being that this is a lab, the concept is let's build it all from sources. Now they have all the details and all the documentation in their uh, documentation here on how to build it from sources. It's actually really cool. Uh, and they did a nice job of documentation overall, but they also, like I said, details how to do this. Or you can go here. And this is the Zen Orchestra Updater, Zen Installer from Sources, and this is a GitHub script. I have full instructions on how to do and use this on my video that I'll leave a link to, how to build Zen Orchestra from Sources using Zen Orchestra Install Updater. I've had people say they can't find the video. I don't know how to make it any uh, clearer, but I will link it down below as it's pretty easy to find for how to build it from sources using this update tool. Works really well. It makes it really easy. They also have Docker images if you don't want to take the time to compile. So let's go over here. 
The first thing you want to do after you have it loaded is get Zen Orchestra running. And that quick deploy is probably an easy way to do it. Once you have that running, you're going to want to build a VM. But you're probably asking, well, how do I at least get one ISO on there so I can build the VM? Well, I do recommend doing the quick deploy for it. And I'll show you how to set up local ISOs. This is actually not my favorite way to put these on here. But if we're talking about a single lab server, this will definitely get you started. So... This is how you create a local ISO repository. Now we're gonna assume you already loaded the XOA appliance and the XOA appliance system, the free one uh, with the quick deploy here, completely will let you do this uh, without even activating the trial. You can add this local. So I figured I'd show how this works real quick. When you go here to create a repository and we'll walk through the system. So we're gonna go new and we'll say new storage select the host which is the xcpng lab and we're going to say we want a local iso repository path to directory well we're sshed in over here uh, we'll call it local iso local iso now we're going to go ahead and find something to download and I'm pulling this from the Debian page, so we'll just copy this link here. We're in the ISO folder, and we'll just type uh, wget to pull it. But you could use whatever tool to get this in here. And what we did is in the root of this system, we've added this particular ISO. Now, the problem you may run into is there's a limited amount of storage in the local system and that limited amount of storage means, well, you're not going to be able to put too many ISOs in here and you could cause problems. So this is not my favorite way to do it, but it is a way at least you can start getting some ISOs on the system. But I want to show that this is possible and how this part worked. Do an LS and PWD. So we're at local ISO right here. Let's copy that and we see that there's one Debian ISO in there. So what's the path? Local ISO. We hit create. Well, actually we gotta give it a name. Call it like local ISO here. Create. Oh, please fill out the description. There we go. Let me look at what drives are in there. There we go. Pretty much one disk, one simple system in there. Not a big deal. Uh, if you want to put a few more in there, but like I said, there's a limited amount of storage. That's how you would do that. And then to create a new VM, you go over here to new VM select the pool, select the template, and we're gonna say uh, Debian 10, because that's what we downloaded in there. And then you would select the ISO. And there's our local ISO. Now, I obviously have a lot more ISOs in there. We're gonna talk about the better way to do it. So right here's that Debian one. If we wanted to go ahead and create it and we could go through the load process and build a VM. Not going to do that. We're gonna go back over here to storage pools and let's go get rid of the local ISO one, remove it. Got to disconnect it. Yep. Yeah. It's stuck because it, there it went. Something, it was stuck because they thought something was using it. It takes a second and now it's gone. All right. So if you go back over here to storages, I have this free NAS ISO. The way this got on there, pretty simple. This is a free NAS server with a bunch of ISOs in it. Now this can be, this is just as SMB mount, but this can be done in a few different ways. So we're gonna to go to new storage, host storage name, select the value and you have local NFS or SMB. You put in the server name. Now this can be your Windows server. If you have all your ISO files on a Windows server and you have an open share or a share with a username and password on there, uh, you put all, fill all this in and create and it will read all those on there. It only has to be a read only share because it's just pulling the ISO files. So this is another option for getting all the ISOs in there in the better option, especially because I have so much storage on my free NAS. Now, what about adding other local storage. Well, I'm not going to dive too deep into that because we have some available local storage for things, but kind of the same thing when you're adding a new storage. So we're going to go ahead and look at the existing storage again. And we'll look at this right here. This is my free NAS named Dozer and Mount Dozer Ben Lab. So let's go ahead and show you how you add one of those. We're going to go new storage again, select host, free NAS, NFS. It's just an NFS share. The Basic options of NFS share. We'll log in and look at those real quick. We'll choose 
NFS 192.168. Default NFS version, hit this little query, and look, it found all the different ones that are available on there uh, that I have, including the lab VM, which is actually not a good idea to add the same one twice. That would probably create some problems. Uh, so I'm not going to do that. But this, you kind of get an idea. That's a pretty easy way to do that. Now, what does it look like? Just really quick in FreeNAS. And you can do this with Synology. You can do this with really anything that supports NFS. And here's the uh, Zen Lab VM share. We're going to edit advanced mode. Check the box that says all directories. Make sure it has permission to uh, read, write access into that storage. Like I said, whatever you're using for storage, that will work. A few other options that are inside of the Zen server. We're going to go back up here. It does have, and I've covered this before, how to set up iSCSI on there, LVM local, ZFS local. So they've built in ZFS. If you have a bunch of drives, you can go to the command line and time to get over ZFS. I think I have a separate video on that. LVM or simple uh, EXT local. So if you just have a device, you can just point it at that device and it will create an EXT file system or you can create an EXT file system on it and point it at the device after you create it that you've attached. So there's plenty of options to dive into and their documentation is pretty good on that. So once those pieces are taken care of, let's jump into the networking part. Now there's two pieces to the networking. It, it's sometimes a little bit confusing, but let's get break down and explain it by starting over here. This is my lab. This is my XCPNG lab system running an AMD. I put the processor in there because someone will ask. It's an FX8320 with 24 gigs of RAM and a single 120 gig SSD on there. So the hypervisor and all the VMs live inside of this one physical box. The network card in here happens to be an Intel X520 10 gig card. There's a lot of different 10 gig cards that work. I like the Intel ones because they seem to be very, very compatible. This is going to my Unify switch. My Unify switch is set up as a trunk port, uh, which means all VLANs are passed across here. That's an important thing to remember. So all VLANs. And uh, that is also the native network is the 192.168.3.1 network. That's native VLAN one. And I'm bringing this up because we're going to talk about not just how to create a network, but also how to create a couple of VLANs in there. But it is important to know that it's a single physical network connection, but we're going to create VLANs inside of here and show you how they work. Um, and they're already defined either in the Unify switch and the PFSense or just the Unify switch. That's going to vary with some of the switching equipment, but at least you should be defining those VLANs within there if you want them to work on the ports. We're also going to talk about the private networking features that are in here. Let's go back over to this and look at kind of the IP layout of what we have set up. So my PFSense manages the 192.68.3.0 network and the 172 network. I do have defined, but not managed in PFSense. It's only defined as VLANs in my Unify, uh, VLAN 20, VLAN 100, VLAN 200. I just created these so I have some extra VLANs for uh, doing things where I may want something in the physical uh, side of the server to come out to a physical port. Um, I'll be doing those later in advanced videos. I just want to mention they exist, but you do have to have these defined in your switching equipment. And that's because we're going to be running PF Sense inside of here as our lab, which you've seen me do before if you watch this channel. And that's how I get PF Sense inside the system to talk to outside systems is by splitting off these VLANs. But physically, the lab server is, like I said, one physical Ethernet cable connected at 10 gigs. So there's the assignments we have. Here's the lab server itself, the XCPNG, and this is a virtual machine running on it, the Zen Orchestra, and it's at dot .28. So let's dive into the networking side of things. Now, please note I am using the fully compiled version, uh, like I have in reference to my other video, of Zen Orchestra. That being said, I did compile it with the flags, and you can look through the details when you set it up or use a Docker image to say, make sure all the plugins are there. This is important because if you don't have some of the plugins, specifically the plugins related to the uh, SDN controller, you wouldn't be able to do some of the steps in this video because the SDN controller has to be turned on. So if you did compile it that way, great. You just have to turn the SDN controller on. And if you try to create a network without that turned on, it prompts you with a link to the instructions of how to turn that on. So let's go over to the networking under host. And we can see the network interfaces right here. This is the one that's assigned. The other ones can all be left alone. You assign them to the VMs, but you don't have to assign anything more than a single IP address within the actual physical XCPNG machine. But you notice I can't edit these networks. So that seems kind of odd, right? Well, not really. And 
uh, ignore the fact that for my lab demo, we did set it to DHCP instead of static because I wanted PFSense to handle that. So if anyone wants to point that out that I said set it to the other way, yes, you can set it to static, but I choose DHCP. That way I can manage everything with my PFSense, just FYI. And you can see it's connected at 10 gig. But then we have VLAN 20, 10 gig storage. Let's go ahead and add another network. Now, even though I can't edit them here, let's talk about exactly how we add them and where they end up. So we go over here to network, select the pool. And if we had more than one pool collected, it would give me all the options for the other pools. You can see which ones are plugged in and ETH0 is the one we want to use. And we're going to call this VLAN 69 because the VLAN tag is it is oh, not the MTU. I'm sorry, uh, 69. You can leave the MTU at default. If you want to tweak it, they do give the option to leave it at default unless you know what you're doing there. So we just named this VLAN 69 to make it simple. We'll go ahead and create network. All right, and we're going to do another new network. Select pool. It does have bonding options. If you were to select multiple interfaces, that is an option in case you're wondering what that is up there. So you can bond them together. Studio 100. Create network. And we'll do one last one just so we match what we had in the sheet over there. Over here to network. Actually, 200, copy and paste the wrong thing here. 200, 200, 200. Now we're going to go to Home, Pools, and we edit all the networks from the pool. This is where you can actually change and uh, set settings on these and use them and rename them to something different if you want. And the reason you edit them in the pool is so all the hosts have matching network interfaces in that pool. And let's show you that in production. So if we go over here, we go over to my production pool here, and we look at the network interfaces, and let's say we have this, this is dot three general network, not in use, studio 200 lab network. Let's edit this one to say lab network. So we'll put this as lab network. And I have in here, go to the host. You can see that network is now in this host and that network is in the other host as well. So what this allows you to do is create it in one location and this automatically gets propagated to the other ones. Pretty straightforward, um, but if you're even, if oh, this is a host of one, it's still the way the practices are of doing that. One important thing, the network order has to match in order for this to work properly. So ETH0 is plugged into and trunked all on my main system, just like it is on my lab system. So both, of my servers, the XC, XCPNG running on the 630 and the other one, go over here back to host 720, both have a matching set of network interfaces plugged in the same way for the network. It's There's ways to rearrange them. It can get a little tricky, but generally if you're putting them in, you want ETH0 on each computer to be plugged into the same network. That way, if you pass any VMs between, there's not any weird things that happen. And same goes for each subsequent network interface. The cards can be different types of cards. They should just be plugged into the same network interfaces. So that's a little side note on when you're building the machines, but it's something that is fairly important to do um, when you're doing that because you're naming them all in the pool. All right, back to the system here. So now that we have those networks built, let's talk about building one more network, and that's a private one. So the private networks are different. So the VLANs work fine for when you have the system, and we'll go open the system requirements here. The VLANs are for when you want a, a network, of course, to pass through your network and switching equipment. But sometimes maybe you don't necessarily want it to openly pass through there. And there's a couple different options. So they have VXLANs and encrypted GRE tunnels. I've already got one VXLAN created on there, and you can create one VXLAN or one GRE tunnel, and it has an encryption option. And you can, if there was more than one pool, we'd have the add pool option. And these are kind of neat because what this allows you to do is have an extended software defined networking controller. And you can find this, uh, they have a lot of information on it, but one SDN controller, three different pools, 
many different hosts that can talk to each other through an encrypted tunnel. Now, this is an interesting way you can build out a pool and have intercommunications between the VMs and tied to a backend VXLAN that's all encrypted and you're able to pass this data back and forth as if it's kind of a almost like a VPN, but it's actually at the network layer. So everything goes across there. And this is sometimes used in data centers, uh, but when you're building out something kind of specific for yourself and you want to play with a lab and you say, I want this locked down, don't let it leave into my networking equipment, but this particular VM needs to stay behind whatever firewall we put in front of it. And we will demo how to set up PFSense in front of it. That's one of the other options they have in here. Um, it's pretty pretty neat. I'm not going to dive deep into it other than, yes, it's pretty easy to create and pretty easy to uh, maintain. And the reason you still tie it to an adapter is so it knows what adapter to leave and go out through the system when you're setting it up. So uh, that is definitely an option in there. All right. Let's go over to PFSense now. And we're going to say filter none to show all the VMs that are on this machine right now. And we'll go over here to the PFSense lab setup. And let's look at the networking. So we have the VLAN 69, which let's just change it. So we'll have it plugged into 10 gig native, which gives it a 192.168.3. address on there. Um, and then I said Studio 100 and Studio 200. Now the Studio 100 and 200 are not defined in my PF sense. They are just VLANs defined in my switching equipment. And this allows me, if I want to put any ports on my switch, um, to trunk it to that particular uh, VLAN tag, I can say tag 100, tie it to one of the switch ports, and then the PFSense in here will then feed any devices that are outside of my network for my lab testing. And this is how we do some of the demo videos that you see in our studio. So we'll go ahead and fire this up. Now, as far as getting PFSense on XCPNG, they have a tutorial right here, right in their blog post about how to do it. They have entries in our wiki on how to do it. And I will comment on this. There's two approaches to setting up VLANs, and I definitely, by far, as it says here, the easy solution and perhaps the officially supported approach for XCPNG. When you do this, DOM0 hands all the VLAN tagging. What that means is, as we were doing it and creating all those network interfaces, each one of those network interfaces is attached to the main XCPNG system, and it's handling the VLANs. And PFSense, which should be booted up now, it is. We'll go ahead and log into it. It does not see these as VLANs, but as actual adapters. So by handling it inside of here, and we'll look, log into PFSense real quick, it does not see these as VLANs here. So if we look at interface assignments, we go over here to VLANs. There's no VLAN tagging going on here. Everything's treated as an interface. So instead of adding more VLANs to here, even though they are, because there's only one physical adapter on our XCPNG machine and everything else is trunked out with the VLANs, and that's how we're slicing these up to build out the separate networks, you don't actually define them here. There is some information on here and ways to do it, but it's it's kind of, I don't know, it doesn't seem as well supported. Uh, it's more challenging to do that. And I don't think you gain any benefit from it um, other than you'd be able to define and play with VLANs inside of PF Sense here. But uh, that, like I said, kind of a one-off thing. I mention it, but I prefer to do it the way that I have this set up. But WAN was the first interface, LAN, LAN2. Uh, ignore this, this is for another demo, but these are the interfaces that we have attached that we have right here. So you can see that the Second one down, XN2 has the 40 network on PFSense. So we should be able to go over here. Network, and we'll attach it to the Studio 100. So now we've attached this to Studio 100 and we'll boot up this uh, Debian server, Debian on my lab server here. And it now is behind the PFSense and should get an IP address once it boots. Boot it up, let's log into it. And it has 192.168.40.119. We go over here in a PF Sense Services DCP server. Hey, look, there is the Debian lab assigned 192.168.40.119. Pretty uh, easy enough to find there. And what if we wanted to change it? What if we want to put it on the other network? Well, that's actually pretty easy. We go over here to network. We'll change it to the Studio 200 option. And now it has 10.10.11. So that was, and we'll just do it over here. Go back over here to PFSense. You can see that's the other network inside of PFSense, the XN2 network adapter that's attached to that. Pretty straightforward to do. Now, the only tricky problem I have had, and PFSense might get angry if I do this, is it, let's go ahead and change it. So let's try that lab VXLAN. 
sometimes PF Sense, yep, it didn't like that. So let's see if it actually worked. Sometimes you do have to change, uh, when you change a network adapter, restart PF Sense. Not all the time, but some of the time I've had this happen. Um, yep, it still thinks it's disconnected, so you just have to reboot it. So we'll reboot PF Sense real quick, and uh, it'll come right back up and running. So we'll just go ahead and uh, reboot it. It doesn't like the network adapters on PF Sense being changed without a restart. I'm not sure what the workaround for that is or if there's some driver I'm missing, but I did follow the instructions and I do see that happening. It does have, as you can see, and it's stopping right now, the Zen Guest Utilities running in the background, but that still happens. So we'll let this reboot real quick. All right, PF Sense is rebooted, logged in, and now we change the network to this lab VXLAN. So we're not gonna go through the whole demo of extending this VXLAN across other pools, but just to show you basically, if we take and go to the VMs here, and now this server, we'll move it over to that uh, VXLAN here. There we go. And we still have the 10 address and we should be able to get out. And we're on the internet. So we can ping things, we can get out on the internet, things are resolving, network works perfectly fine. Now the one other network type that's worth mentioning in here, we can go over the pools, XCB and lab, go to networks, is the host internal management network. Networks on which guests will be assigned a private link local IP, which can be used to talk to the Zen API. Uh, these are kind of neat because this is local only to one physical host. So you can tie things to this particular adapter and this will allow you to have communication uh, only inside of this particular machine. So it doesn't have anything else, but you can tie this once again to PFSense and then build your networks behind it and everything flows back out of PFSense. Now, the other question that comes up a lot is what if I want to virtualize my PFSense and run it inside of here? Well, if you may have noticed, I labeled a couple of these uh, not in use, not in use. And that's just kind of a general house cleaning I do when I set them up. If I don't have and there's nothing plugged into uh, these other network interfaces like ETH1 and ETH2, I'll list them as not in use. But what if I wanted to use them? And what if I wanted to use it for my cable modem to plug in my virtualized PFSense so I can have it all virtualized? Myself, I prefer to run PFSense on real hardware. That way, if I'm ever troubleshooting something I did inside of Zen server and it didn't boot for some reason, I have easy internet access. But if you insist and want to run it this way, you could call this uh, cable modem. And the reason you might want to call it cable modem, A-B-L-E modem, is you would take this and assign it to the WAN. And calling it cable modem would help you uh, hopefully not accidentally assign it somewhere else. So if we were in here and we seen it and we go over to networks and if you, whoop, if you assigned it cable modem, you would go, huh, I'm assigning something, a network called cable modem. So if you label it like that, it's a good clear way to let you know where to assign it to. And where would you assign it in PFSense? Pretty straightforward. You go here and you would change the native network. And we're using a native network because this is essentially double natted as my lab system. But I would change this to cable modem because VFI, VIF uh, number zero is right here. It's the first network in it. Or if you're looking in the console, you'll see that it's X and N zero inside of PFSense and assigned here via DHCP. Now, in case you're wondering, can't you assign more than one thing to your cable modem? Yes, and it's essentially the same as when you come out of the cable modem and you plug it into your switch, uh, any type of switch, and then plug more systems into it. What happens next is really based on the support level you have with whoever your cable providers. Or really, if you're uh, doing this and you're getting like, let's say a fiber handoff that does give you a whole block of IPs, yes, you could assign them all through here or even have XCPNG and have that one port that we label cable modem uh, attached to multiple PF senses or multiple different things that you have virtualized inside of here. Maybe you want to have a server, have a direct public address. That's another way to handle it. So there are some different use cases that do work if you want it publicly done. Just be careful when you're doing that because what you don't want is because obviously it's so easy to go here and go to the network and swap these to really any network pretty quickly. You don't want someone to accidentally do that and accidentally take a server that's supposed to be private uh, for local communication and just throw it out on the public internet. But that's pretty much it there for setting up the networking. Pretty straightforward. Now, anything else you do from here, um, I've gone and got videos on how to do the backups, how to do the config, uh, backup restores, uh, settings, setting up the remotes, and 
Uh, there's a lot of other features that are in here that obviously you can play with. There's uh, importing VMs, importing just a disk and setting up, you know, new servers, new storage, new VMs. And I have other ones on how the entire HA process works where we took uh, several servers, tied them together to a single resource pool, put it in HA mode and showed how it auto failed over between them. Now, because this is a self-compiled version, uh, like I said, it does have any uh, support. If you want to use it in production, they do have a purchase option. And if you decide after playing with this in your lab and you want to run this at your business, there is paid support for both XCPNG and Zen Orchestra and support packages available that do help out the developers of this. That is the way they monetize is they make money selling support packages for the whole system if you want to use it in production. But it's a pretty awesome system. I've been using it for a while. We've got a lot of clients running this in production. I'm really uh, happy with it. It's been an excellent project and 100% open source. So all the features, and uh, I've talked about some of the other ones, details before, like the vMotion that you see in the ESX, ESXi world uh, does work inside of here. They have the Zen Motion, as they call it. So I can move and transition live servers between pools and a lot of those other bells and whistles, including uh, doing snapshots and snapshots with memory. So you can snapshot something in place and grab live memory for backup. So there's a, a, so many features. I could probably go on another hour, but I won't. If you look through my videos, I have a few more on there. And of course, they got plenty of documentation you can go through and do your, your own reading. And they have a very lively community and forum where you can also have discussions as well. So all right, and thank you. Hopefully this was helpful. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon if you like YouTube to notify you when new videos come out. If you'd like to hire us, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out our contact page, and let us know what we can help you with and what projects you'd like us to work together on. If you want to carry on the discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can carry on the discussion about this video, other videos, or other tech topics in general, even suggestions for new videos. They're accepted right there on our forums, which are free. Also, if you'd like to help the channel out in other ways, head over to our affiliate page. We have a lot of great tech offers for you. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.